All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning here at Lighthouse and Cypress Center. My name is Dave Weber, and we're going to be conclu continuing and concluding this morning our series on Don the God. So this is part five, I believe it is. This will be the conclusion of this series. We'll start a new series starting next week. And just so you know, all of our teachings are archived on our website, lighthouseofsepperson.org, as well as our YouTube channel, Lighthouse and Cypress Center. But all, all that said, let's go ahead and jump in this morning as we uh, conclude this, this series this morning. Our theme verse, that we're, th our theme verse, excuse me, let me say that again, uh, that we've had during the series is from Psalm 78, verse 41. It says, Yes, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. <coughs> excuse me. Again, this is speaking about Israel when they were going to enter into the Promised Land and they were wandering in the wilderness. Well, a journey that should have only taken one year, and they wanted 40 years because they tempted God over and over again. We limit them. When we limit God, we tempt Him. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. And so, and how do we limit God? We've been discussing that throughout the series, but we limit God, and one of the, one of the main ways that we limit God, I believe, is also because of the cares of this world. The cares of the world, the seedlessness, the riches, and the desire for other things entering in and choking the word, and then becoming unfruitful. This is extracted from the parable of the sower. Okay, this is the third, uh, third type of seed. And it's choked out by the cares of the world. <coughs> yes, there's the seedlessness of riches, and the desire for other things, but those, I think, still stem from this concept of the cares of the world. The Bible says in Proverbs, guard your heart with all, all diligence because out of it are flow the issues of life. Excuse me. And so and then we got the cares of the world. That's why we are to be still and know that he's God. We live in a very busy world, not just fast pacing. It might be busier here in the West and <coughs> excuse me, some metro parts of the world. But than some other parts of the world. But we need to just be, our minds are going all the time. There's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of things that we need to do. There's the cares of this world. There's the cares of life. And we need to pause, just like Jesus did many times, and be still. No, he's done. Okay, we need to, to be like Elijah, who, yeah, he was complaining about God. He was complaining about how Jezebel was trying to kill him, just like all the other prophets. Uh, okay, and excuse me. And he went and go when he went all depressed, pouting about life. And God wasn't in the wind, he wasn't in the earthquake, he wasn't in the fire, but he was in the still small voice. Okay. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We've made life so complicated because we do it without God. We limit God by doing it without Him. We limit God by not resting in Him. We limit God by not trusting Him, relying on Him, being God dependent instead of being independent. Okay? I think I said that backwards. We, we limit God by being independent instead of God dependent. Okay? We need to, Jesus even said, come, He said to His disciples, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. It's not all. It's not all work, and it's all not all rest. I mean, we're not. He's not talking about being complacent. He's not talking about being lazy. He's talking about being still and knowing that he's God. Okay. I don't care what thing you're doing for God. I don't care what type of ministry you're doing, or what you're doing for the kingdom, or what you're doing for your family. You need to have time where you're being still and knowing God. If you don't have time to have a relationship with God. You are limiting God in your life big time. Okay. And so we need to spend time with God. We need to, I'll come back to this first later, but we need to <coughs> bring every thought to captivity to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. Our minds are racing. Some of you can't sleep at night. Some of you have no peace in your heart, in your life. 
Because your heart, your mind is not stayed upon him. And I'll come back to that verse as well. I just quoted from Isaiah 26, verse 3. Okay. Excuse me. When, when we bring every thought captive to you, we crack up the stuff to weapons of our warfare. That's how we fight. This fight, this like the fight of faith. Okay. We need to be still and know that he's God. You know, Paul said that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Why did God choose the foolish things? Okay, yes, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and his own special people that he may proclaim the praises of him who called the out of darkness from over. Yes, we are special. So, you know, why did he choose the foolish things? To be the special people. Okay? And yes, we're this, but it's in Him that we live and move and have a being. Okay? We are special, but we need God. God has, we are an asset. God has invested Himself to us. He has bought us with the, His own blood, with the blood of Jesus. We are special, but we need God. We need to be God dependent, not independent. Okay? Because it's in Him that we live and we move and we have our being. It's His beauty that is upon us and establishes the work of our hands. It, our hands are, the work of our hands are established by Him because of His beauty that's upon us. Okay? We also need to, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they know me. You need to hear God's voice for direction. You need to hear God's voice for wisdom. You need to hear God's voice for your provision and your affirmation of who you are as a child of God. You're just making sense so far. Okay? Excuse me. When we, when we don't take time to hear His voice, we limit God because then we make decisions or we, or we are indecisive because we have limited God. Because we are not including Him in our decisions. We are not walking with God. We are walking by ourselves. We are to walk with God. In the same way that you receive Christ, so walk ye in Him. You can't say you're walking with God if you're not taking time to hear His voice. And if you're not taking time to hear His voice, then you're limiting God. Okay? It's about relationship. We're not... We're not in a religion. We are in a relationship with the living God. <coughs> we also, excuse me, trying to get this out of my throat so I can uh, uh, speak. <coughs> All right, I rebuke this box so I can speak in Jesus' name. Amen. We also limit God by, by fear. And I'm going to list, I'm not going to go a lot of detail, but list seven types of fear that, fears that we have and, 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 and how these fears limit God. The first one is just the fear of the unknown. You know, we, we get stretched when we have, or come across something that's unknown to us. And there's a change of the unknown. Or we don't know what's going on tomorrow. Or we don't know the unknown, whatever that unknown looks like. Let me just preface these seven things by saying, from 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love. I'll come back to this verse later, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment, and but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Okay, there's no fear in love. So if we are experiencing fear, we have not been made perfect in love, and we are limiting God in love. Because God is love. Okay. But we have we fear the unknown. We don't know we're in the end times. We don't know what's going to go on in our country, our world, our government, our families, our finances, our health, and whatnot. We have the fear of failure. <coughs> it's the second one. So the first one is the fear of unknown. The second one is the fear of failure. Some of you won't get out of bed, won't get out of the boat won't get up in the morning, won't do anything because you have a fear of failure. Okay? 
But we've already established in this series that, that for I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future of hope. And the King James says that to give you an expected end. Okay? We need to step out of the boat like Peter. Many of us are, are, are tethered to the dock and wonder why God's not leading us. Because you're, you're playing it too safe. A few years back, the Lord told me I was dead. I didn't understand that concept. So I had to look it up. I had to study it. I had to ponder that. I had to meditate on that concept. And I was just too tender to dock. Even if I drifted, he could at least be the wind of my sails. But I'm tethered to dock. I'm not going anywhere. Let me just say this about the fear of failure. God's will... Is the safest place you can ever be. Being in the center of God's will is the safest, safest place that you can ever be. Years back, Sherry and I went through a lot of different attacks by uh, people who were just attacking us for slander and betrayal and gossip. It was a very severe time for us, very hurtful time for us. But you know the thing that kept us safe, kept us afloat, was knowing that we were, in the, we were in the center of God's will. And we would hear His voice. There was a lot of other voices out there, a lot of lies out there, a lot of hatred out there, a lot of evil going on. But we heard His voice. And we knew we were in the center of His will. And we cleaved to Him and not to the, the words of man. Okay? And so, um, we, we had a we were doing what God calls to do, not what man calls to do. Because God's calling in my life, God's calling in your life, was not a conference call. Okay? And so, you know, sometimes, a lot of times we are paralyzed. And, you know, being paralyzed is our, our worst failure. Doing nothing is failure. Not getting out of the boat, not doing, not being in the center of God's will is the worst, <coughs> excuse me, is the worst failure of all. It's insanity to keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. So you need to start doing something different. You need to expect something very different. Some of you need to just change your expectations. Okay? You're limiting God because you have a fear of failure and you want to play it safe. You won't get out of the boat and you keep doing the same thing and wonder why there's not a different result. The worst failure is Jacob have been paralyzed by fear. But you need to simply know what God's will is and go for it. Do it. It's the safest place you can ever be. Okay? Because remember, going back to 1 John 14, there's no fear of love, but a perfect love casts out fear. So how do we get rid of this fear? We spend time in God's presence. God is love. It says that in, in verse 8 and verse 16 of the same chapter. God is love. And when perfect love casts out fear, he who fears not in a perfect love. So what do you need to do to your experience of fear? You need to spend time with God and you need to get to know his love for you. Okay? I got to spend some more time with that. But his love, his presence, will give you rid of fear. Our security is in him, not man, not in ourselves. It says in Proverbs 24, 16, For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked man will fall by gravity. Maybe you're in a place where you're, you're, you're falling. You're a righteous man, a woman of God, but you're falling. Well, a righteous man may fall seven times. Where you can say, you can say Pastor, Dave, Pastor Dave, I've fallen eight times. This is... Don't... Based on just how many times it was, there's a principle here. You might fall multiple times, but a righteous man will rise again. Okay? I don't care if you fell a hundred times. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. I'm not banking on your faithfulness, I'm banking on his. Okay? But the eyes of the Lord run through and to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him in, 
this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have one. And I'm talking on the last part, not part of the context, but there's a, there's a promise here that God is searching to see whose hearts would be more up to him. <coughs> the thing I'm trying to paint the picture is that we need to be totally committed to God. We limit God when we're not totally loyal to him. We're not totally committed to him. See, I'm not committed to my calling as a pastor. I'm committed to him. And he who has called me is faithful. Okay? So I'm, I'm going to be faithful with that. You know, D.L. Moody said this once. The world has yet to see a man. Let me say it again. The world has never seen what God can do through one person who is totally committed to him. I want to say that again. D.L. Moody said this. The world has never seen what God can do through one person who is totally committed to him. If you're totally committed to God, he can do exploits in your life. If you will commit yourself completely to God, he will do great things in your life and through your life. But when we are not totally committed to God, we limit God. And most times we're not limited to totally limit God is because of fear. Fear of failure. So how do we conquer this? How do we get over this fear of failure? How, <coughs> excuse me, how do we get over fear of period? I'm going to go over seven fears this morning. But I've already touched on two, but what I'm going to say right now will, is how you get over all these fears. And I've already touched on it, but you need to get in his presence. You need to get in his presence. See, in the book of Joshua, several times Joshua makes a statement, take up the Ark of the Covenant. Over and over throughout this book, I'm not going to put them all, all up there this morning. But he says, take up the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant represented many things, but one thing that represented it was his presence. God's presence. So how, that's what Joshua did, in a literal way. How do we apply that today in the New Testament? <coughs> how do we take up the Ark? of the covenant today. How do we apply that today? Because the ark represents his presence among many things. We apply this today by pressing into his presence and passing and, and passing him, his presence, and our covenant relationship we have with him above our circumstances. I want to say that again. We do it by pressing into his presence. We do it by passing his presence, passing our covenant relationship with him above our circumstances. You have a circumstance, maybe it's finances or lack of finances or bills or whatever it will be, and you say, I have a covenant relationship with God. My God shall supply my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And I'm exalting his promises, his word, my relationship with God, my covenant relationship with God above my lack. You can do that with sickness. You can do that with direction. You can do that with persecution. You can do that with any type of attack. So I'm exalting my covenant relationship with God above what is going on in my life. You can simply say something to the effect, I claim this covenant right I have, this finance, this amount of finances, or, or this victory. You can say, Satan, I command you to get off my, get your hands off my money, get your hands off my business, get your hands off my family, get your hands off my body. Go, angels, and ministering spirits, and, and, and cause the, the, the money or the, or the thing I'm, I'm believing God for to come, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I am a, uh, a, a heir of God and a co-heir with Jesus. When you know 
who you are in Christ, when you know who you are because of the finished work, you have authority and you can lift that covenant relationship with God above your circumstances. And it has to bow to the finished work of the cross. Get into his presence where there's flows of joy. Get into his word. Worship him. Pray in the spirit. Pray in tongues. Build yourself up in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. Practice his presence. And as you process his presence, you show the enemy you are taking back some of the things that belong to you that he's stolen. Like Joshua, you will lift up the covenant of God, and you will drive out the enemies, and he, he, God, will drive out the enemies for you. The enemy of fear, the enemy of worry, the enemy of anxiety, the enemy of lack, the enemy of just even a bad mood, the enemy of lack, and any type of attack of sickness or lack. And we have authority over the enemy. We have authority to release God's angels to go and bring it into manifestation. You can declare, I is, I, see, I'm trying to read my notes here. You can declare, I've decided to set my attention on Jesus. You can declare that. Sometimes you need to hear it with your own ears. I declare I set my attention and my allegiance and my focus and my heart and my mind on Jesus. You can simply be reminded that you are God. Little children have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he that's in the world. You can be reminded that you of, the, of his fullness you have received in grace for grace. Why? Because <coughs> excuse me, there's no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment, but he who fears does not remain perfect in love. God is love. And his presence, his love casts out fear. <coughs> and when we know this love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask and think. <coughs> Excuse me, according to the power that works in us. Hope it doesn't make any sense. You know, I get distracted by my, my cough this morning. Okay. See, when God, perfect love, I want to go back real quick. <coughs> perfect love casts out fear. And when we know we have experienced his love above intellectual knowledge, we are filled with his fullness. And that, that fullness, the fullness of God, is able to do above and beyond like we can imagine, according to his power, his presence, does that work in us. We can be reminded that I can do all things in Christ who gives me strength. I can be reminded, I've been crucified with Christ no longer, I who live as Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I can remind, be reminded that his beauty is upon me in my business and my job and my fields and my farms and, and establish the work of my hands. It's established the work of my hands for me. We can be reminded that we live in him, in him we live and move and have our being. We can be reminded that he, Jesus Christ, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. By these promises of God, by being in his presence, by knowing our covenant relationship we have with God, <coughs> we can overthrow anything that is thrown at us, because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty, for God will point out strongholds, casting down every argument and high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bring every thought to captivity to the obedience of Christ. Anything in your life, any a cough, <coughs> excuse 
excuse me, now, right now I just bring this car that exalts itself over the knowledge of God into captivity in the name of Jesus Christ. Any calamity, any sickness, any 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 lack, you can bring that thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God into captivity. That is our weapon. And when we don't do that, when we don't do that, because one, we don't know what authority we have, we don't know the promises of God, and we don't do it. We limit God in our lives. The Holy Spirit is constantly reminding us of the power of the, the power that enemy was exhausted. Excuse me, through the finished work of the cross. I want to say that again. The, the Holy Spirit is is constantly reminding us that the power of the enemy was exhausted through the finished work of the cross through Jesus Christ. Satan is powerless against me. And I can thank Jesus for the victory in Jesus Christ. And that's actually going to be my next next service. I'm going to be teaching after this one. Talking about our victory that we have in Jesus. The third fear I want to touch on this morning is the fear of change. It kind of goes with the first two, but <coughs> excuse me. Most of us don't like change, even good change. Change scares us. We all, many of us, fear change. Again, even good change. But if we want a different result, we need to do something different. Okay? It's by our, many times it's our, we make the word of God of no effect by our simple traditions. Some traditions are lovely, and they're powerful, and they're, they're good. But many traditions that we have, we make the word of God of no effect. We live in God. Because we, we don't want to change. We've always done it this way in this church. We've always done it this way in this family. We've all, I've always done it this way in my life. And you're always going to get the same result. It's insanity to expect a different result if you're not going to change. Okay? And so we make the Word of God many times of no effect because of our traditions. Andrew Womack has a book and a teaching called Effortless Change. It's based on the concept that we abide in God, and we, we abide in Him, and His Word abides in us, just by the fact that we're abiding in Him, His life, His nature will change us. And there's no effort. But even, even in that teaching effortless change, Andrew will teach that there's effort. <coughs> Most of the effort comes from God, not us. Our effort, though, is to enter into His rest. We have to abide, and that takes effort. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, let any man fall after the same example of unbelief. When we abide in him, there's an effortless change that God will do in, our, in and through our lives. And we live in God because we don't allow God to change us effortlessly. But there is an, there is an effort, even an effortless, to change, and that is because we need to labor to enter into that rest. So that he now us can change us. Okay? In Mark 7, 13, Okay, I don't have this in here. Oh, I already read that. Okay, excuse me. Mark 39, whatever. In Palm 20, he says, As a man thinketh, so is he. Well, we need to, so we need to change the way we're thinking. Okay? We're not called, see, we're not called to just coast through life. And many of us are flying way below the radar where God wants us in life. Because we're playing it too safe. You have a purpose, you have a destiny, and many of you are on the verge of quitting. And my charge to you this morning is that don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. God will always call you to do something that's beyond you. God will always call you, if he's called you, but buddy, you try, trying to uh, imagine your own calling, but God's calling you. He has called you to do something that will require you to trust Him, rely on Him, and to cleave to Him because only He can do it in and through you. You can't do it without Him. And if what you think God's called you to do is something you can do without God, you haven't heard from God. 
that God will always call you to do something big. That will call you to commit and will require you to depend on Him. And so maybe many of us we need to change our thinking. Okay. We need to cast out the fear of failure. We need to cast out the fear of change. And we need to change the way we're thinking. We need to find the mercies of God. We need to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, call ourselves to God, which is our reasonable service, and, and not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Until we are transformed by the renewing of our mind, we're not going to know the will of God, and let alone walk in it. We need to allow God to transform, revolutionize our mind. Okay. The fourth type of fear I want to talk about this morning is the fear of man. Okay, it says in Proverbs 29:25 that the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. <coughs> the fear of man is, is a snare. Insecurity is pride. We know that pride goes before fall, but insecurity is pride. We should be secure in our relationship with God. For many of us, we are afraid to do anything for God because we have a fear of man. We're, we, many of you are paralyzed because you don't want to be criticized. And you limit God because you have a fear. Of, your fear of man is greater than your obedience and allegiance and trust and reliance on God. And you limit God. You know, you know, when David came on the scene with Goliath, he was berated by his own brother. His own brother criticized him, Eliab. And I love David because he was so established in his covenant relationship with God, he just turned aside if someone else would listen. But most of us would have ran go and cried home, Daddy. You don't know what I went out there to bring cheese and crackers and that he told me to, and my, my brother he called me names. I'm being facetious right now, but I'm making a point. Is that most of us are have a fear of man that we are we're going to be uh, being criticized. Okay, if you're going to be a Christian in this world, you're going to be criticized. Okay. At the same point in time, we need to stand up for the truth. You know, when the early church was being persecuted, what did they pray for? They prayed for more boldness. They didn't pray for the persecution to stop. They prayed for more boldness. Okay? In 1 Kings, uh, before, I turn to, before we turn them, Elijah was being attacked by Jezebel. And he stood up to King Ahab. And Elijah, the Tishbite, uh, Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilad, said to Ahab, as the Lord of God Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew on our reign in these years, except on my word. Because Elijah stood up to King Ahab, he prophesied that there would not be a rain for any plants for three years. I mean, it's, to me it's not about the rain, or lack of rain. Elijah did not have to fear even, even King Ahab. He stood up to him and spoke the truth. Okay, you have to read the rest of the context in verse in first Kings chapter seventeen and even be and verse uh, fifteen. Because the chapter starts with the word A in a conjunction. So you have to read chapter sixteen to find out what's going on. Okay. So uh, you know it says this in the Leviticus nineteen seventeen. You shall not hate your brother in your heart and you shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear the, the bear sin because of him. In other words, the Bible says, even in the Old Testament, that if you if you don't rebuke your brother who's sinning, you hate him. If you don't are not have willing to stand up for the truth, you hate your brother. Now, we can say how I many know we can say the right thing the wrong way. We need to do it in love, but we, 
we, we, we're not here condemning the brother. We are there. We, there's a difference between rebuking somebody and condemning them. We condemn the action. We love the brother. But we can rebuke them. Am I making sense? We hate our brother if we do not stand for the truth and rebuke him. You know, a good friend, and we should all have good friends in our lives, who can speak the truth to us. I don't allow everybody, and I don't allow everybody on Facebook to speak into my life. But there are some brothers that are in my life that they can get my face and they can speak the truth. Okay. That makes sense? The, the fifth kind of fear I want to talk about real quick goes kind of with the fear of man, but it's a fear of persecution. Some of us don't want to speak the truth because we are afraid of persecution. Well, let me tell you, in 2 Timothy 3, 12, all who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. If you desire to live godly, because all, all means all, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will, not could, not may, will suffer persecution. That's a promise. If you desire to live godly, you'll suffer persecution. It says in John 3.20, And everyone who passes evil hates the light and does not come to the light. And we're the light of the world. And if you are the light of the world, the world is going to hate you. Everyone who passes evil hates the light. And you know when someone hates you. It's evident. Sherry and I have experienced that even in the church at times. Okay, hate that hatred. Okay, it's evil. It says in John 15 to 20, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. There's a lot here, but the point I'm trying to make is persecution is guaranteed. Now, let me say this, some, some of the persecution we are experiencing in the West right now is not what people like people in Pakistan right now are experiencing. People in Pakistan and other parts of the world are and have experienced what I call true persecution. I believe it's coming to the West at some point or level, okay? But persecution is persecution. I think we're talking about different levels of persecution. Being martyred is a lot different than being criticized. And someone speaking evil of you. And that's as far as it goes. Okay. <clears throat> and, but, true persecution, but there's a difference between just the fear of persecution of being martyred and just having the fear of man and someone's going to speak naughty about you. Okay. There's a different level. There's a different level of fear. I mean, you know, if, you, if your life is on the line, that's a little different than someone just uh, saying some bad things about you. But people have fear of both. Some people actually fear man being criticized more than they fear dying, because at least they're dying, they're not going to experience it anymore. You know, and I'm not trying to belittle that. But my point I'm trying to get, because we're talking about throwing them at God. No matter what type of persecution you're going through, and we've been promised persecution, God is enough. God is enough. Stop complaining, stop whining, kicking and screaming. There's no restraints of God. There's no snares of God. <coughs> the fear of man brings a snare. As long as you don't have a fear, and how do you have it? How do you cast out the spear? The love of God. Okay, and if you are so grounded and know the love of God, that which His fullness is in you, and it cast out fear. Because if God's fullness is in you, God's fullness is in you, why are you fearing? The God who created the universe, the God 
who can calm the storm, the God who split the Red Sea, the God of the universe is in, his fullness is in you, and you're going to fear man? But when you know the love of God, and you're filled with the fullness, he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ever ask. See, when you know God's love, there's no snare. There's no restraints. And you can do what God's called you to do. And you can be who God's called you to be. Because God is with you. And he who's in you is greater than he that's in the world. We limit God because of fear. And, if, and when we fear, we have not been made perfect in love. Am I making sense? So how do we fix it? We get perfect in love. You get to know his love. You get into his presence. And you let God love on you. And that will overcome this fear. And you can do what God's going to do no matter what's going on. Okay? But again and again, throughout history, in Trump, Israel, tempted God, and tempted God, and many of us have too. Okay? And you can read the whole story in Numbers chapter 13. I'm not going to bring it on the screen. I've been talking about this throughout this whole series. But it's talking about them going into the promised land. They were not able to go to the promised land. And the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 3, 4, and 5, goes in greater length of this. But they couldn't go because of unbelief. They couldn't go because of going back, because of the fear of man. They, would, they feared the giants. They feared man. Okay? And because they feared man, God's promise, the promised land was delayed for another 40 years. They were supposed to get there in one year and end up being a whole generation later, except for those who did not have the fear of man, like Joshua and Caleb. Okay? Right, in 1 Samuel... We have the story of David and Goliath. And David spoke to the man who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine? <coughs> and takes away the request from Israel for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? See, David had a different spirit, he had a different mindset. It was very similar to Joshua and Caleb when they went into the promised land. Well, this was several generations later. <coughs> and David could have seen when Goliath is, is defying the armies of the living God. And he's like, who's this uncircumcised Philistine? David didn't care how big this guy was. He didn't care about his armory. He didn't care how old he was for his own age. He was like, who's this uncircumcised Philistine? God's enough. There's nobody on this planet, and even all the people on this planet combined, that's bigger than my God. And we, when we compare the circumstances, any man, even a giant, compared to God, and we exalt, have fear over them over the versus God, we limit God. David didn't limit God in the, in the scene. He knew who his God was, and his attitude and his response was, Who's this uncircumcised Phil? Oh, he's, he didn't see the giant. He didn't see the armory. He just saw uncircumcised Philistine. That's all he saw. Compared to his God. Who's this? Now, the sixth type of fear I want to talk about this morning is a fear of success. It's that the fear of success is the opposite of the fear of failure. Success through the years has destroyed many people. Success has destroyed more people than hardships and failure ever have. I want that to sink in for a moment. Success has destroyed more people than hardships and failure ever has. It says in Proverbs 30, 79, 79, 
Two things I request you deprive me not before I die. Remove the falsehood that lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me, as I be poor and deny you, and say, Who is the Lord? Unless I be poor and still and profane the name of the God. This is a proverb. Okay. And basically Solomon is saying, I don't want to be rich or poor. Because there's on both sides of the ditch, there's a pitfall. There's a pitfall in success. If you don't allow God to be God in your life. Riches and success are a tool, a resource. You can't let them have you. It's okay to have them, but you can't let them have you. Am I making sense? See, Proverbs, pro Proverbs are true whether you're saved or not saved. Am I making sense? The principles... In the book of Proverbs, I true whether you're a believer or not a believer. They're just Proverbs. Okay. But even the world will cry out to God in the crisis, and they have. Many atheists have cried out to God in the crisis. But it's when everything is going well, when the grass is green, money's in the bank. And there's peace in the land. And everything's going well. Is when we stop relying on God. We stop reverencing Him. When we are in a crisis, we come crying out, out to Him. But when everything's going well, we forget the Lord our God. And how many times do we read in the, in the Old Testament? When they did well, they prospered. But when they prospered many times over a period of time, they forgot the Lord of God. And there was consequences. Sin came in. And there were generations that they totally forgot the Lord of God. And that came from success. Okay? God, they, 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 they got in the crisis. They come crying to God. They repent. God delivers them, they become prosperous again, and then over time they forget the Lord of God, and they went through that cycle, cycle over and over again, and some of us have done that cycle as well. So, so because that, people have, some people, when people know that, they have the fear of success, like we just read about here, right here. Okay? Solomon is even saying, he has a fear of success. And he was the richest man on the planet. Okay? And we can see so many times, I mean, in the, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, I'm not going to put it on the screen this morning, you can read about how God warned them before they went to the promised land, don't forget the Lord your God. Even King Saul, the first king, in 1 Samuel 15, so Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, when you were small, in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel, and did not and did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? And then in verse twenty-six, it says, but Samuel said to Saul, "I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king." When Samuel was young, and and he was small in his own eyes, he trusted God. And there was blessing and blessing and blessing. And then he became successful. And when he became successful, he rejected the word of God. And there was consequences. He lost the kingship. And Proverbs 16, 18 says, But pride goes before destruction, and a high spirit before a fall. That happened to Saul, that's happened many times throughout history, and that's happened in some of your life as well. It says in 1 Peter 5, 5, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your, your elders. Yes, of all, of all of you, be submissive to one another, and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Many of us have the fear of success. But the, the only reason why success is dangerous is because we forget God. 
And when we forget God, we limit God. The key is, and what we're talking about in this whole series, is that we don't limit God. The, the seventh area that I want to talk about fear, and it kind of goes with success, is the fear of prosperity. It kind of goes with it. So they're kind of, they're kind of twins. But just like success, prosperity, prosperity has destroyed a lot of people. More than any hardships and failures ever have. Prosperity many times. When we talk about prosperity, in this church and is a benefit of our salvation. It's okay to have money, but it's not okay for money to have you. There's a difference. Okay? And so, prosperity many times has caused people's hearts to become hardened towards God and it's caused kind of apostasy. But it's not really money that's a problem. It's not prosperity that's a problem. It's not the, the success that's a problem. It's the heart. It's the fact that when we become successful, when we become prosperous, we forget the Lord your God. And we stop being God-dependent and we become independent. That's the problem. Okay. See, when we are independent versus God-dependent, we are limiting God. But if you, by God's grace, no matter how much prosperity or success you have, you can keep God as you, you keep dependent on God. You're going to be okay, and you're going to be powerful, because your heart is totally committed to Him. Am I making sense? It's not the success that's a problem. It's not the prosperity that's a problem, because whenever, in the Old Testament, whenever they got right with God, God made them prosperous. God made them successful. The benefit, the blessing, the fruit of them being right with God is that they were prosperous. They were blessed. You can't be right with God, being obedient to God, depending on God, trusting God, and not be prosperous. And yet when you become prosperous, you stop being dependent on God, and then you go down, and there's a spiral downward, you forget the word of God, and there's calamity again. The, pro the, the key is that we have to have faith in God. We have to trust God. Because the byproduct of trusting God and walking with God is prosperity and success. It's not the only one, but it comes with it. Okay? It's the fruit of walking with God and being right with God. But the danger is that when we get right with God and we're walking with God and we start becoming prosperous, we start becoming independent instead of God dependent. And anytime you're independent, no matter where you are in the spectrum, you're going to live with God. Okay? That's what happened to David and Bathsheba. We saw the victory of David and Goliath. But it was at a time where Israel was prosperous and doing well that David, instead of being at war when he should have been, he was out strumming on the rooftops one night and looking where he should not be looking. And we all know the story there. See, fear, and I talked about seven kinds of fear this morning. Fear will dam up the blessing of God. See, when we are walking with God and depending on God, trusting God, relying on God, coming to God, we're going to be prosperous and successful. We're going to be blessed. But fear will dam up that blessing. <coughs> when you fear, whether you're fearing man, fearing success, fearing failure, fearing change, you will you will hold back God's blessing. I want you to hear that. When you are fearing anything, because where does fear come from? Fear comes from not being established in his love, not being protected by his love. So fear will hold back God's blessing in your life. But when you yield, when you yield to God, when you yield what he told you to do, and you say, "Go, I'll go for it. I'll do what you told me to do. And I'll be who you told me to be. And you are totally God-dependent. You release the dam of God's blessing you. 
and that God's blessing, the miraculous blessing of God, will come gushing forth. Many of you are like, well, when is my blessing going to come? When you step out like the priest and step out into the water and you do what God's called you to do, the blessing will come. It will release the man. But as long as you have fear, you're holding back not because God told you to wait, but you're holding back because of fear. You damn up the blessing. But once you respond to God and do what God's called you to do, rely and trust on Him, there will be a gushing, a flow of that blessing. I want to conclude today in this message by talking real quick about imagination. I've talked about this a lot in previous talks, but I want to teach on this briefly real quick here in closing and how it relates to don't worry God. Okay? See, imagination, we think in pictures. God gave us an imagination. Okay? And if people like Disney and whatever they helped us, helped us bring that out in our in our generations, recent generations, you know, through Mickey Mouse and different things, they brought out that imagination a lot more. But God... Uh, we think in pictures. Our imagination is powerful. In First Chronicles 29, it says, O oh, oh Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the intent of the thoughts of your heart, of your people, and fix their hearts towards you. I'm just going to use this as a springboard real quick. That just like our forefathers, the patriarchs, we need to keep God's word forever in the end of our hearts. We need to allow God's word and God's covenant and God's promises to be a picture in the imaginations of our hearts. So I'm going to ask you this morning, when you look at your life, when you look at what God's called you to do, what do you see? How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as poor? Do you see yourself as a sinner? Do you see yourself struggling with sin? Do you see yourself uh, sick? Do you see yourself struggling in life? Or do you see yourself as a child of the living God? Who's prosperous? Who's blessed? Who's well? Who's whole? Who's doing what God's called you to do? What do you see? What is forever on the intent of your heart? In 2 Corinthians, it says that we walk by faith and not by sight. The just shall live by his faith. So what is your faith in? Because that faith is painting the picture in your heart. Worry will also paint a picture in your heart. When you're worried, you're anxious, you're fearful. When you fear something, you're... You, you can't help but, you, when you're fearful about something, you're worried about something, you're anxious about something, you mow it over in your mind at night when you can't sleep, you mow it over when you're driving, or you're alone in the shower, or you're laying on your bed, and you start, you keep playing this word picture, well, what if this happens, what if this happens, what if they said this, or what if this happens? You're painting and role-playing pictures in your mind of the worst-case scenarios. But faith is the opposite. They, instead of seeing all the negative and worrying about it and mowing over it and meditating on it, we can meditate on the, what the, let the Word of God and what God has spoken to you personally and what God has spoken to you by His Spirit and let that be a picture that you roll and you can see yourself doing what God called you to do. We all have mastered this in, in the area of worry. When we worry about things and we mull it over and we role play and we see our, we see everything going wrong that we thought could go wrong. Well, we, we reverse down the way God intended and put it forever in the intent of our heart, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when he, 
God made promises with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob individually. And the rest of their days, it was forever in the intent of the heart. And they walked by faith and not by sight. That's why Abraham is called the father of faith. Okay? Instead of worrying and role-playing over and meditating over and over in all the worst-case scenarios, we can role-play over and over in all the things God has promised and called us to do. What do you see? Because God is enough. Don't limit God. Don't limit God. We can do. He said, I said to you, if he who believes in me, the works that I do, I, you, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Do you see yourself doing the works of Jesus? Do you see yourself laying on hands on the sick? Do you see yourself speaking to the waves and the, and the storms? Do you see yourself cursing the fig trees? Do you see yourself <coughs> casting out fake devils and raising the dead? Do you see yourself doing even greater works than these? Do you see yourself doing exploits in Jesus' name? Rather than seeing all the things that can go wrong because of worry, are you seeing the things that you can do because you're a child of God? You've been redeemed. What do you see? Because you need to see it on the inside before you are going to do it on the outside. Earlier this year, I spent a lot of time talking from Romans 121. Because what, but that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. When we don't glorify God as God, we limit God. That is what thankful. When we don't are not thankful, we limit God. But became vain in their imaginations. If your imaginations are vain. Because you're worrying about things versus glorifying God as God and being thankful. How do you not limit God? You glorify God as God and be thankful. And your imagination won't be vain and your heart won't be darkened. But if you're not glorifying God as God in your life and you're not being thankful, your imaginations are vain. The things that you think about are vain. The things that you imagine are vain. Am I making myself clear? Okay. But we need to be established and know his love. That surpasses knowledge. It should be filled with his fullness. To him who is able to do above and beyond that you can ask or think according to his power. This is normal Christianity. This is not limiting God. Okay. This is. Not glorifying God as God, not being thankful, having vain imaginations and a heart that's darkened, is not. It's limiting God. This is not limiting God. Okay. It says he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusts in him. Where does your mind stay? Is it stayed on worry? Is it stayed on condemning and judging? Some of you on Facebook, all you do is judge people all day long. That's where your mind is staying. You see all the negative in people. You're on, you're on a hunt to find all the sin and dark garbage of this world in people. How do I know that? Because your mind is staying there. Out of the bottom of your heart, your mouth speaks. Is there a time that we need to rebuke our brother? Yes. But if you need to find sin in your brother, you need to rebuke him privately first, not on a public post. If the first time you were duking your brother is in a public post, you are wrong and you are out of line. Ah, I don't have time to go there. Okay. You will keep your perfect peace too, whose mind is stayed upon you. Use what God has given you. The widow used her the jars to get the oil. Peter used fishing. To get a coin. And I could go on and on and on and on about how you can use what God has given you. The, Jesus used the boy's lunch that was given to him to feed the multitudes. Don't limit God and say, I don't have enough. God can use what you have right now to meet your needs. 
His beauty is upon you. Don't limit His beauty. And His beauty that is upon you will establish the work of your hands for you. He has established the work of your hands. Delight yourself in the arms of the Lord, and He shall give you desires of your heart. He's the one that will conceive him, and he will the one that will finish him. Commit your way to him, trust also in him, and he, not you, will bring it to pass. Where do you start? Delight. And once you have a desire burning in you because he gave it to you, you commit your way to him with that desire, trust him with that desire, and he, not you, will bring that desire to pass. Imagine God's will. See yourself doing what God's called you to do. Let that word be conceived and gestate and germinate in your heart. Aim at the stars. Some of you are not aiming at all. And you're not going anywhere, not doing anything. But how that, because many people have the understanding darkness. Being aided in the light God because of the ignorance of that is in them because of the blindness of the heart. That's where a lot of people live in me. But I know that my God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God is enough. Don't limit God. Well, this concludes my series on don't limit God. There's a lot more I can expound on this. I hope this has charged you. I hope this has encouraged you. I'm going to kind of be going, continuing on these lines, but under a different title, that I'm going to be starting talking next week about victory in Jesus. It kind of goes with, if not a totally different concept, but it will be a new title with a new direction. Um, but it, it goes with what I just talked about, not limiting God, as we're going to be talking about our victory that we have in Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. We'll talk to you soon.